Get your driver's license out before you post on Facebook. Let's have a look. Hello everyone, Florian Heiser here and welcome to another episode of Heiser Says. Grab your stein of coffee because today we're going to have a look at IDs required for social media, everyone. And naturally, we're going to look at the article that is, you know, working its way. All the media outlets are talking about it. Government coming to the rescue. What has brought this about? Why are they all talking about ID for social media? Oi, Gov, you got your license for your memes? Uh, because, of course, it's always the government to the rescue. And I want to show you some solution, something that I think needs to come out of this. If they're going to implement this requirement, which I suspect they would, or the you know you know our government, we need to push and advocate for other well other laws to be pulled back and freedoms to be enshrined for Australians in a real bill of rights. But let, let's have a look to, at this. So Tinder, Facebook, Instagram to require ID proof under a new proposal. This is the article from Yahoo Finance that we'll be going through. Australians could be required to provide identification to join social media sites or set up anonymous dating profiles under proposed reforms designed to stamp out online bullying and har harassment. That is the goal of this. Now, the federal government is reportedly considering new reforms that would see people forced to submit identification, such as a passport or driver's license, in order to create a profile on platforms such as Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or Tinder, according to the 7 News report. Now, there you go. The reforms are designed to quash bullying, trawling, harassment, stalking, and sexual abuse online, informed by people hiding behind anonymous accounts, or performed by people hiding behind anonymous accounts. Now, you've got a whole lot of people that are trolling that create anonymous accounts online. I never appreciated it. I understand why some people do. There are a few reasons. People would feel, well, maybe they simply want to speak their mind. But uh, yeah, perhaps if it got through to their workplace, they could lose their job. Maybe they have a an opinion which the woke crowd doesn't consider politically correct and you would be harassed and bullied for it. That's different to trolling. Maybe someone is trolling just for laughs, just for the jokes, or they're trying to use memes to make political statements and to shock and provoke. Or you also got just idiots who are harassing and stalking. I mean, you, you get all of that online, everyone. At the moment, no ID is required before joining any social media or dating platform, although some sites ask users to provide their email or mobile number. Now, here's the thing, everyone. When you're online, you will cop a lot of it. If you put any opinion out there, you'll cop uh, trolling, rubbish. What's more annoying is, frankly, the, the bots that try and, particularly if you talk anything in finance or property, the bots that try and sell sell you know mimic you and sell whatsapp scams and things like that so online bullies or stalkers are able to issue abuse or threats without any risk of being caught or identified see this is the thing you'll have people that will you know keyboard warriors that'll write all these things these comments but then you meet them out at about at a workplace and you, you discuss maybe okay here's an idea we need to um <laughs> minimum wage I remember I actually went to an event uh, and I was talking about, you know, there's some real issues with minimum wage. Everyone wants to keep it, but it creates uh, unemployment and it squeezes some people out of the economy and no one would dare even talk to you if you talk about that. Or if you're even a critical of, of negative gearing, people will look at you like you're a nutcase just in regards to property. So there's some people that don't want to even discuss anything. Because remember, you don't discuss politics, you don't discuss religion, you don't discuss anything in public. And how many of those people are then keyboard warriors going nuts on the keyboard? How many people wish they could speak in public about things, but they're concerned for losing their job? So a parliamentary committee report on online abuse found... See, that's not really what the report is on, but that's one of the aspects of the, of the parliamentary committee. Found that faceless and nameless people could harass victims online with little risk of sanction. The report suggests the requirement of 100 points of identification to create a social media account. Okay, 100 points. In order to open or maintain existing social media accounts, customers should be required by law to identify themselves to, to a platform using 100 points of identification in the same way as a person 
must provide identification for a mobile phone or to buy a mobile SIM, it said. And we'll look at that because that's only one of the recommendations. And now, this is from uh, the government coming to the rescue. And some people are concerned that we're handing over our private data, you know, ID to these to these uh, social media platforms, or it may be limiting, discriminating against some people from partaking in the public platform, you know, the public square. But here's the thing. You don't need to be on social media, everyone. You can actually live your life without being on it. Or you can just put your name out there, identify as you are, and don't be a bastard. <laughs> but to ensure that, there needs to be some other protections put in place. And I'll get to that later, but it comes down to having a Bill of Rights, honestly, and enshrining freedom of speech. So the government to the rescue, where does this all come from? So it's an inquiry into family, domestic, and sexual violence. On June 2020, the House Standing Committee on the Social Policy and Legal Affairs adopted an inquiry into family, domestic, and sexual violence. The inquiry was referred to the Minister for Women, Senator the Honourable Maurice Payne, and Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator the Honourable Han Rustin. The committee published its report on the 1st of April, and they thanked the many organisations who submitted to it. And here, these are the committee members, everyone, just so you're aware of the politicians. So you've got, you know, a mix of, well, really only the two main apart, the two major parties. And here are the terms of reference. So, the Standing Committee on Social Policy and Legal Affairs inquiry into and reporting on family, domestic and sexual violence, including with a view to inform the next national panel to reduce violence against women and their children. The following. So it wasn't just on online abuse, everyone. This was a, a big panel. So immediate and long-term measures to prevent violence against women and their children and improve gender equality. So here's my concern right off the bat with this inquiry that the first statement that they have here is gendered, everyone. The first statement right here is a gendered statement because we have seen Intimate partner violence, IP, IPV, it's, it's not really gendered. It's bilateral, statistically. And there are very few facilities for men or fathers out there. We talked to Jeremiah House in the past. I've interviewed some of the people. So it's sad that this standing committee is, well, so gendered. But that's the way we're at at the moment. Best practice and lessons learned from international experience from the prevention to early intervention and response that could be considered for the Australian context, the level and impact coordination, accountability and access to services and policy positions. What else do we have? The way the health, housing, access to services, including legal services and women's economic independence impact on the ability of women to escape domestic violence. Now, I mean, here we go. This Look at the title of it into family, domestic, and sexual violence. But this is all gendered, everyone. The whole thing is gendered. All forms of violence against women. Okay? There you go. The adequate and uh, quantitative and quantitative evidence-based prevalence. Oh, boy. See, I'm concerned that it's so gendered. And they've got any other matters here. This, this is what they were talking about, guys. So the reporter who's referring to it in this article kind of... Well, it wasn't just about <laughs> Facebook and Tinder. It was, well, a very gendered standing committee. Now, all the, the gentlemen who are watching, they wouldn't be, very, wouldn't be surprised with any of this. All the MGTOW guys would not be surprised at all. But perhaps to some people, it's... A lot of people are concerned that, and are shocked, actually, when you tell them there aren't any um, homeless shelters or support shelters where a man suffering from IPV could go for go to with their children if they're trying to escape a violent situation. That's just our culture. Nevertheless, the committee has received over 298 submissions from a range of organizations. This is a significant number of submissions, everyone. So it's a, a well, quite a touchy subject. And here is the recommendation. The recommendation from the outcome, all of the submissions. This is there were 88 recommendations, everyone. And this is the one the media is jumping on. Not the fact that the whole process was gendered by the very beginning. Because there, there are some men out there that suffer from IPV. Intimate partner violence, everyone. I've done videos on this topic in the past. 
It's it's a sad reality. So, the committee makes the additional following recommendations relating to technology facilitated abuse. There should be a greater acknowledgement that appropriate technology use is a shared community responsible responsibility. It is not simply a responsibility of platforms to host and police content. There should be greater clarity around a platform's obligations to remove content, including through the Online Safety Act, in order to open or maintain an existing social media account. Customers should be required by law to identify themselves to a platform using 100 points of identification, in the same way as a person must provide identification for a mobile phone or to buy a mobile SIM card. Social media platforms must provide those identifying details when requested by the e-safety commissioner, law enforcement, or is directed by a court. The government should consider regulation to enable law enforcement agencies to access a platform's end-to-end encryption data, there you go, by warrant, at least it's by warrant, in matters involving a threat to the physical or mental well-being of an individual or in cases of national security. So there are other other concerns that are just creeping in here, guys, that, that, that are, you know, we've got to focus on people using the ID. The government here in Australia can have so much access to your information, even when you leave, leave for the airport. There should be a substantial increase in criminal and civil penalties for technology facilitated abuse to act as a greater deterrent for errant behavior. The government hosted websites and applications should have readily available and searchable avenues where, to, where a victim, survivor of technology facilitated abuse can seek assistance to have abusive material removed expeditiously. Because there is, I mean, there's some horrific content that people are putting out there and people obviously are not mentally fit who are going through this, who are acting, a normal person wouldn't act like that. So they there are some concerns with it, but you can see how the ramifications of it, well, can play through to other, other aspects. Now, there's concerns. You know, this is from Emily Van der Nuggel. Hello, it's me, a social media researcher who has argued time and time again that it is not a good idea to force people to submit ID to use social media. It won't so- solve harassment. It will only further harm already vulnerable groups. Don't do this. I mean, do you think it will actually make a difference? The people that are harassing others online, that um, are, are the victims of the, you know, this abuse, do you think it's going to stop that? Having to give your ID. I mean, if, if someone is harassing someone, they'll probably just keep doing it anyway. But again, you don't need to use social media, everyone. <laughs> That's the thing. You can step away from it, but it's becoming more and more uh, ubiquitous throughout daily lives. A lot of people access information from it. I mean, could you just go on a tour and use it like that? So there are also concerns about your isolating people from the social media platforms, which are the, well, which is now the, the public debate, the public square, where people can are meant to have a debate and discussion, but... I mean, there's certain things you can't talk about on these platforms. There's certain things that they won't allow you to share. So is it really the public space or the public platform? There are alternatives you could go to where you have much greater freedom to speak your mind, but they don't have the reach. So it's not really a public square, is it? So there was a previous inquiry, and this was the adequacy of existing offenses in the Commonwealth uh, in the Commonwealth Criminal Code and of state and territory criminal law by ca- to capture cyberbullying. This is a few years ago, what, nine years ago now, I think. And one submission that just, because I was looking for, I uh, was doing some research for this video, and one submission here just stood out that I thought I really should share with everyone because, well, it's a nice little thing, just a nice little touch. This is from the Western Australia Police. So Western Australian Police Forces submission for the inquiry into the adequacy of existing offences in the criminal, sorry, in the Commonwealth Criminal Code and of state and territory criminal laws to capture cyberbullying. And the key points here we'll go through. The WA Police Force finds existing laws adequate to address the majority of reported matters. The term cyberbullying encompasses a wide range of behaviours, some of which should not be criminalised. Police should not be cast 
into censorship. I mean, look at what's happening in the UK. We've got some of the British viewers there where the police are arresting people for bad tweets. Look at what happened to, to Dankula. Lowering the bar for criminality too far could generate a substantial increase in reported crime, drawing police into non-core roles, such as arbitrator, arbitrator and censor, and increased demand on police resources. So I know that's a bit off topic for what we're looking at in this article, particularly with regards to the ID, but it was very encouraging to see this coming from a police force. I know it's a bit old and maybe it's all changed right now, but there are officers that don't want to be running around policing rubbish like this. So, solutions. Now, I think what Australia really needs, we need really, we need to get freedom of speech. We need to have a bill, advocate for a Bill of Rights that enshrines freedom of speech here for all of us in Australia. And it, we need to make sure it doesn't have the little provisions like the Victorian Bill of Rights that's completely garbage. They can just write a report and get out of it. We need to repeal a lot of the hate speech laws. We need to really step away from the government funding organizations to allow one party to sue another party. Because that really is, is uh, frankly, I think one of the biggest issues. If you're forcing people to give their identification away so they can be doxxed, because that's essentially what it is. Sure, you've got a few, a few nutters here that are, uh, you know, troublemakers. But most people will be concerned because if they express a political opinion on the socials and then the mad, you know, woke mob dog piles on them, they could lose their job, they could lose their livelihood. We need to ensure freedom of speech is real in Australia. We don't have it here, guys. We're not America. There's a lot of issues in the States, but you know, they've got a lot of stuff right too. We need to steal those ideas and adopt some of the good ones here. Because then if, you know, right now, if you could uh, have freedom to have speech here online, but you had to identify yourself, would you be brave enough to speak your mind? If you know, someone couldn't fire you for your political opinions. The dog pile mob goes on there. Sure, there'll be social consequences, but you could counter that much easier if your freedom of speech was protected. What do you reckon, everyone? I think this is what needs to come out of this. If we have these, this push for ID to use social media, we also need, it needs to go hand in hand with protections for our speech. As always, let me know your thoughts and opinions on this one in the comments down below. Thank you all for watching. If you're a fan of the channel, and enjoy the content I produce, there are a few ways you can support us. You can join us on YouTube or Patreon. You can support us using affiliate links on Amazon, eBay, Independent Reserve, or Aussie Broadband. Take care, guys. Have a great day, and I will see you all next time. Bye for now.